So do you think that individual is on this planet at the moment? Yep. Do you know who that individual is? Yes. Is it someone that we would suspect? In other words, is it someone uh, in a place of high leadership? No. Have you met this person? I am that person. Now I understand why you haven't been on radio shows. So you you are you're saying to us that you are the person that makes that decision? Yes. Of course I'm under a great deal of pressure. The community of ETs have wanted me to make this decision a very long time ago. Very pessimistic about humankind on this planet. Are you from this planet? More so than you. How how is that possible? I'll just say that I've been here a very long time. Okay. So um, you've been here longer than your current human years. Yes. I've been through this so many times, and elsewhere, too. On other planets? Far, far away. Some some within a few light years. Mm -hmm. Relatively, you know, 30. 40 ha light. Have you been through it here on this planet with previous civilizations on this planet? Yes. How many, how many uh, phases of civilization then clean the planet off and then start again? How how many times has that happened? On Earth. Uh huh. Seven. So it's been cleaned off seven times, or it's been cleaned off six, and we're the seventh. Only one successful civilization has gone beyond that that point of mm -hmm. no return successfully mm -hmm. to something better, become a part of, of something better. All right, now I have some uh, questions about, uh, because this is all brand new information for me. This is not something we talked about previously. So I have a question. Sure. Back when you were four years old and all of this stuff was happening, and then when you were six and it, you had these guys, these men in black, and the, the strange experiences you've had through your life, at what point in this incarnation do you begin to realize that you are what you've just told us? When there was a tip made on my life when I was six years old. Okay, man, I wish we had time to get into that. We just don't. We're we're almost out of time. Would you be willing to come back and talk with us again? Yes. Okay. Well, folks, I, I'll tell you something. Uh, I, I told you right at the beginning that his views and perspectives do not run on the same rails that most of ufology runs on. But I found it to be so interesting and so compelling that I thought you needed to hear as well. And add to that that one of the AlphaCom team members recommended that we have him on the show and uh, said he finds him to be uh, very, very interesting and, and credible. And so um, I just thought you needed to hear for yourself and think for yourself and ask your questions and judge for yourself the information that you were presented tonight. And I can tell you this, the information that you've been presented here tonight 
according to James, has never been, he's never presented this information on a radio show. Uh, he's, he isn't writing any books. He's not producing any movies. Uh, he's, he's stayed pretty much, uh, well, as we used to say, he's kept his head down and his powder dry. And, uh, he's, he's, um, stayed pretty much in the, in the shadows. One quick question. Can you travel in time? Well, I don't actually think of it as that, but, uh, yes, uh, I, I do what is called phasing. Okay. The end of the show has happened. The music is taking over. And we're going to have to call this one a wrap. But, James, I want you to stay on the line with me for a moment. And I want to have you back because we got lots of questions for you. All right, folks. I tell you, if you miss a second, you miss a universe. My friends call me Steel Eye. My enemies do, too. You can call me whatever you want. Just keep coming back again and again and again. Until next time, so long, everybody. Comments and views expressed on The Kevin Smith Show are those of the people that make them and do not necessarily reflect the views of Kevin Smith, The Kevin Smith Show, or its affiliates or sponsors. Hi, folks. Welcome to the Kevin Smith Show, whoever you are, wherever you are, all around this beautiful place we call Earth. Thank you for being here at the Kevin Smith Show. It is talk radio like nowhere else on Earth, and it is the radio show where you matter. Don't forget, if you have not yet subscribed to the K-Files e-zine, be sure you do. It is our free weekly newsletter. Being absolutely free and no strings attached, there is no logical reason why you should not be subscribed. You can uh, subscribe by going to my website and click on where it says K-Files. We've all heard about Majestic 12 over the years. The Majestic 12 has been the UFO Secrecy Management Agency in the USA for decades. It no longer operates under that name, we hear. The MJ-12 Special Studies Group had a lead agency called AlphaCom, which operated under the umbrella of DARPA. Members of the AlphaCom team held above top secret clearances and had access to some of the most closely guarded and most highly classified information related to UFOs and extraterrestrials. 
The AlphaCom team leader was a consultant to the President of the United States and to the National Security Council on extraterrestrial matters. Now deceased, he and his second in command briefed President Clinton and Vice President Al Gore on extraterrestrial reality. The second in command at AlphaCom was Dick Criswell, who has appeared as a guest on this show many times. Just a side note, Dick Criswell is in the hospital again, but is recovering quickly and is expected to be able to go home uh, sometime this weekend. Now, several members of the AlphaCom team are regular listeners to this show. They prefer to remain unknown and out of sight. And so uh, they seldom call in, although once in a while they do. However, one of the AlphaCom team members recommended to me that I invite tonight's guest to be on the show with me. His comment to me was that this was someone from whom he had gained a lot of information and knowledge about extraterrestrials. He said that what this man has to say is not in line with what most people say about UFOs and ETs. But, he said, he found him to be very credible and a fountain of valuable information about extraterrestrials. So, after talking with my guest for over two hours... I had to agree that his information does not run on the same rails as most people that talk about UFOs. He has written no book about it. He has produced no movie. He does not speak at conventions, and so far as I know, has never granted a radio interview before tonight. He will join us on the other side of this break. Welcome back to the Kevin Smith Show. Um, just a, a, a little side note here, and I don't know why this is happening, but I hear a high-pitched frequency whirling around in the uh, in the background of our audio. But uh, we'll see what happens here. Uh, maybe you can hear it, and maybe you can't. I hope you cannot. My guest this evening is James Horak. As I said, he was recommended to me by a team member of uh, AlphaCom. AlphaCom, of course, as I described, was the um, lead agency in the special studies group under MJ-12. And um, I had the opportunity to talk with James for about, uh, well, over two hours. And I found him to be absolutely fascinating. The information he's going to share with us here tonight is compelling. It's interesting. Some of you may think it's controversial. It flies in the face of virtually some part of every belief about UFOs and extraterrestrials. And yet, I found that so much of what he said held together and made sense. Now, you have to be the judge based on what you hear tonight and based on asking questions. Please, 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 do not send me email saying, why didn't you ask him this? We have telephone numbers, and we'll open up the telephone lines later where you can ask questions, okay? So when we open the phone lines, if you have questions, he is willing and uh, able and here tonight to answer those questions. James, welcome to the Kevin Smith Show. 
Thank you, Mr. Smith. I would like to start off by saying that I am very impressed with the way that you conduct yourself towards your guests. Uh, very impressive. Well, thank you. I would like to pay my respects to a mutual friend of ours, uh, Mike in Kentucky, a good ufologist. Yes, he is a good ufologist, and uh, yet he... Uh he holds uh, pretty much the same views that I hold and I think that you hold, and that is that uh, while I think ufology is um, uh, it's, it's an important field of study, it is populated by a whole bunch of really bogus crap. <laughs> Indeed. Yeah, and, uh, you know, uh, but I've, I'll, I'll tell you, and I've said this before, people know this, I view it kind of like eating fish. When you get to a bone, just eat around it and keep going. Yeah, you know? That's, that's a good euphemism. James, uh, when we talked on the telephone for over two hours, we had a wide-ranging conversation, and you, I found you to be very knowledgeable about a lot of stuff. But I want us to kind of stay focused tonight on something that was really the reason your name was given to me. Um, I did a show with, within the past couple of weeks. Uh, some videos came out on the Internet showing some large objects in orbit around our sun. A very, very strange, mysterious, large objects in orbit around our sun. And uh, I found that to be, um, it, I, well, they're, they're NASA photographs, but it's so weird, you have to do a show on it, because it's something we haven't seen before. Doesn't mean it wasn't there, but we haven't seen it before. This was something new to us. In the course of doing that show, and in the course of the conversation and emails later, um this AlphaCom team member, who, who I'm not going to name because he didn't say I could name him as the source. So uh, he got in touch with me and said, look, here's someone that is my contact on this information. And he gave me your name and gave me your number and told me that uh, he found you to be very knowledgeable and uh, that I would find your information uh, very compelling. So that's how we got in touch, and I want us to focus on pretty much that uh, within those parameters, uh, because that, that's how we got in touch to start with. So are you familiar with these objects? Uh, you know what I'm talking about? Very well. Okay. Um, Let's start with, uh, oh, and let me let me tell folks this. Uh, James is is an extremely literate individual. Uh, he's got a degree in uh, English literature. He's got graduate studies in anthropology, um, and uh, he's uh, worked in a number of interesting fields. And we'll let it go with that. Uh, he has had uh, some other than earthly encounters in his life. And uh, we'll let it go at that, on, on that issue, uh, un unless you want to go further with it at some point later in the show. So, what are these things around the sun? The first person to really detect these objects and detected them in the rings of Saturn, and that was Dr. Norman Bergman. And he uh, used a really... A uh, unique approach to being able to determine uh, the details of these objects, and uh, he had noticed that their behavior was highly anomalous, and that they had been written off as as uh, uh, changing positional moons, which is arbitrary to the def definition of a moon. It has a fixed orbit around the planet. It not a unit or multi-dimensional or uh, positional uh, changing orbit. Mm -hmm. so, uh, so if it's a moon, it has to have a fixed orbit. That's right. 
That's right. That's the definition by definition. Mm -hmm. uh, so uh, what he did, he started paying more and more attention, and he found that they were behaving in uh, highly anomalous ways, that they were very large, and that they seemed to be <clears throat> concentrating their effort on an unfinished ring at its terminals. Around Saturn. In this investigation, this ring was completed by them. Okay, so this is a ring around Saturn that had a gap in it. Yes. And by the time he finished his investigation... The A-ring. I'm sorry? It's what he designated the A-ring. Okay. So by the time he f concludes his investigation of this, that ring has completed and there's no gap in it. That's right. Exactly. And uh, he was able to triangulate by the known dimensions of the ring and by what they had already determined with probes and... Uh, radio telescopes that the size of these objects that were at the terminal of the rings uh, was greater than the North American continent. In, in length or overall? Overall. So bigger than the United States and Canada? Yes. That is gigantic. Yes, it is. Well, that's that's the size of the objects uh, generally in the corona of the sun right now. Man, that's not a mothership. That's a great grandmothership. Yes, yes. But you have to understand that uh, they are, are task directed, and that task requires that they have these capabilities. And size is one of the, one of the things they have to have to, to observe their, their task. Okay, so these are quite obviously extraterrestrial. They're not ours. Well, I I think extraterrestrial has uh, has has too general a meaning. Uh, they are more than that, uh, and uh, uh, you you distinguish between things to to get a precise understanding mm -hmm. of them. And, and that's required in this case because uh, that suggests that they are instruments of extraterrestrials, and they're not. Okay, uh, now, now you have thrown me for a loop and probably a lot of the audience with me. Uh, they're not extraterrestrial, so what are they? I'm going to read you a thing, something that I wrote uh, just recently to a, a, a young poet who that I, I have a dealings with and, and who I respect and who over a period of time, he and I have uh, almost uh, an affinity through poetry. And what I'm going to read to you uh, is going to sort of give a direction to our discussion that uh, is, well, it's self-explaining, and it avoids uh, some misunderstandings that uh, we might have in a general course of just question and answer. All right. May I read it? Sure, go ahead. This uh, poet, before I read it, this poet uh, had been interested in uh, uh, discussing the threats that he saw coming about due to changes in the body politic of the world. And uh, he saw it as very threatening, and so do I to some extent. And uh, out of his concern, since he is religious as well as has a, a, a very uh, beautiful ability as a poet, I, I replied in this way to him. In the order of things are many worlds, all emanating from one sentient source, a source that anticipated all things and set about constructs to survive what was worthy. Each of us have a piece of the worthiness, but that is sometimes betrayed, as you fear, by agendas that go beyond sanity. 
When the worst, such as you describe, reaches the inevitable, it is ended. At this moment, even NASA has admitted are vast objects within the corona of our sun. Some, always there, now is a gathering of many. They have protected this planet from countless cycles of coronal mass ejections that would otherwise have decimated all lineage of cultures present on a relatively short historical rather than geophysical basis. This is the answer of the greatest of all anomaly, how a life-giving fusion star can be so close, yet not cyclically decimate the life it gives. But at the same time, these objects can serve the opposite extreme when what occupies a planet as sentient turns on its own in a manner we have described. Then this is humane, for this hell you've described opened is closed by no other way. We are at that point. In speaking euphemistically, if not literally, these objects are the hand of God. Okay. So, and I was aware that uh, this was the direction that we would take, but I have to ask a question now. Um, on behalf of myself, but also the audience, um, do we need to think of these objects as vehicles, or do we need to think of these objects as living beings? They are living. Okay, so there's no crew on the inside that's flying these things. No, there, there's something very wonderful on the inside of these things. Like what? <clears throat> it is very difficult for me to, to reveal because uh, it cuts a car across so many beliefs, so many mindsets. And I had hoped <clears throat> for the purposes of so many wonderful people's self-discovery that it would not be told. <clears throat> but I'm going to tell you. I'm going to tell you now because in a way everyone has a right to know this. Souls. Souls are inside these objects. Are they the souls of people who have been here living on Earth or... All over. From all over the universe? Yes. Okay, so these objects, um, are they material? In other words, if we could float up next to one in a spaceship and roll down our window and reach out, could we knock on the side of that with our hand? No. You can't approach them. E.T. cannot approach them. But if you could, are they material where you could touch? I mean, if you could approach them, could... Could you touch they, them? Are they material? Or are they no, ethereal? They, they are an energy. They, they, are a, 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 they have form, but they are blinding. You can't see their detail. Uh, it's, uh, you can see Berger detected their marks on the moon and on Mars. And he was right. I don't know how he made the leap, but he is correct. And... Uh, he does know, and he, he's very correct in, the, in some of the features that he's seen as they go about their work. But, uh, no, they cannot be approached. They are, they are regarded with absolute awe by E.T. And uh, when I speak of E.T., I'm speaking of, of people from all over this part of the galaxy. Now, you made a distinction in our conversation between E.T. and E.B.E.s. Yes. Okay. Very important distinction. Yeah. Well, uh, share that with the audience. Uh, we've got about a minute here before. No, we've got about 30 seconds. We'll do that when we come, when we come back uh, right. because we have to take a break. But um, I think it is an important distinction between E.B.E.s 
and extraterrestrials. Uh, and um, the question I'm going to ask you when we get back is this. I'm going to ask you to describe for us the difference between them and then can EBEs be extraterrestrial in origin or are they from somewhere else? We'll be back right after this. Welcome back to the Kevin Smith Show. My guest this evening, James Horak. Um, James, um, I ask a question about the EBs, EBEs, and the ETs. First, tell us the difference between them. Well, this is nothing really new. The Air Force, you uh, and designated them in their own nomenclature, EB, extra biological entity which meant that they were bioengineered and uh, not species. Okay, and extraterrestrials? They're sentient uh, species, um, almost, uh, well, very, very much so humanoid, and uh, uh, have very little differences between us, with one important exception. And what would that be? Of a unified consciousness. Okay, describe that for us. They don't have a, a split mind, a divided house. Mm -hmm. They don't sublimate dichotomy. They don't divide everything up into good and evil, black and white, uh, right and wrong. Which avoids a lot, a lot of problems. Well, it would be uh, difficult for us to imagine how you could not have problems if, I mean, for us, if you don't identify certain things as evil and avoid them, uh, then you would do those things and then there would be conflict, right? Well, you have to understand they survived uh, by the virtue of being in our neighborhood from time to time. They've survived star travel technology. Which, re which means that they have removed aberrancy from the species. Because when you have Star Trek or star travel technology, you have, you've placed in, in, uh, potentially in one person's hand the, the ability to destroy everybody. Okay, now when you say they have removed aberrancy, what, what do you mean by that? Well, like uh, your suicide bomber, like serial killers, like pedophiles, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Okay, now how have they removed all of that from their culture? Well, first of all, they, they don't have the social injustice that seems to breed it. Uh, they don't have a problem with the <clears throat> distribution of wealth. It seems to breed it. They don't have social engineers working on uh, efforts to mind control people into the into doing uh, things against their their own self interest. Uh, the uh, apparency has a source and has a cause. It's not just happenstance or genetic. Mm -hmm. And. Uh, if you go about correcting any problem effectively and you're not at counter purposes with each other, like is so common to a, a divided mind, uh, yes, you can solve these problems. Sometimes you have to do something with uh, genetic flaws, but that's not a good idea unless you have to do it. Okay. Now, how, uh, you know, at 
you're talking to us about what these things are that are around the sun. I want to talk a little bit about uh, what are they doing and uh, what are they up to. But before we get to that, um, how do you know about all of this? I have an affinity with EMVs. What are these objects in the sun? EMV? What does that stand for? Extra magnetic or electromagnetic object. And th this is a name that Dr. Bergman gave them, and I, I honor his discovery and his work. Mm -hmm. Okay, so uh, when you say you have an affinity with them, um, describe that for us. I, wh what does that mean? Well, I'm part of them. Okay. Now, you have to elaborate on that a little bit because, you know, you're thinking way beyond where most of us are. So you're going to have to bring us along a little bit. What do you, what do you mean you're, you're part of them? Well, to begin with, I was an anomaly from my birth. And... Uh, at two years old, I was playing in drainage ditches with snakes and laying in beds of red ants and stuff like that. And run. At four, I was running off with my dog, uh, a behavior that is typical of older boys. And uh, then there was an event that happened that uh, pretty well... Uh, demonstrated some of my uh, characteristics to the establishment when I was four. Okay, describe that event for us. <clears throat> I was born in New Mexico. My mother had left my father and come and come to live with her, her father. And uh, she had a job in Las Vegas, New Mexico, where I was born. Something happened, and she came to Texas with me, uh, her brother, and her cousin. And on the way, uh, there was an attempt to abduct her. And uh, well, who who tried to abduct her? Yes. Yeah, who who tried to abduct her? There were two UFOs. Uh, what I remember is that uh, we were coming to the last, coming out of the last town in New, in New Mexico before you hit the New Mexico Texas line, and uh, I'm standing up in the back seat, and my uncle is sitting next to me, and I see something and I ask him about it. And he thinks I'm talking about the lights in the other direction. And about that time, there's this brilliant white light. And uh, he freezes. And uh, I reach over and touch him, and he's rigid. And my mother is straight, floating out the window. And uh, I don't remember what her cousin was doing. He was driving the car. But the car had stopped. And uh, I'm more or less in a state of concern, agitation, and this head sticks in the window, and it's an EB. And he's looking at me, and I feel this revulsion. And uh, he grabs his head, and he runs to this light that's coming down from a UFO, a circular, typical UFO. And he goes up in it, and when he does, I'm looking at it, and I'm this revulsion is just reaching out of me. And all of a sudden, this UFO starts this grinding noise and throwing sparks and wobbling in the air. And it goes off, and then there is another one above it that I see then when it leaves. And uh, the same revulsion comes up in me, and uh, the same thing happens to it, and off it goes, wobbling. So I look down for my mother, who's lying crumpled on the ground, and and I look over at, at my uncle, who is still rigid, and 
then I don't remember anything until there is this nurse who's trying to coax me out of the car. And I look out in the field, and there are these four white tents that are army tents with red crosses on them like in MASH with the four corners. And I'm, she coaxes me out of the car holding my hand and takes me to one of the tents where these, I suppose, doctors, they're all wearing face masks and they're dressed in white and they put something in my head. Okay, now, the next tell us about... Remember is that, uh, well, uh, hang, hang on just a second. Tell us about when they put something in your head. Um, uh, how do you know they put something in your head? They didn't put you to sleep? No. No, they didn't. So where where did it go? In the in the side? I or the was in a trance or something, but I wasn't. I saw uh -huh. it all. So where, where where did they put it? Into the side of your head or the front or? Uh, no, they just just uh, just above the thorax at the base of the skull. Okay. Did it hurt? No. Nope. Didn't hurt. Okay. So then the next thing you remember is what? I'm in Texas. And Texas, and I'm I'm playing with my my great granddad. Okay. I'm up under the sheets with him, we're playing. All right. So did you um, did you ever talk about this with your mom? What did she say about all of this? Uh, I had feelings about it, and uh, when I would try to bring it up, she would. Uh, uh, so we had an accident. That's all that I want to talk about. If you don't even want to think about it, shut up. Get irate. Mm -hmm. All right, but there were two other people in the car. Did they ever talk about it? No. Only uh, the last time I saw her brother, Merle. Merle had had a nervous breakdown, I suppose, overseas during World War II. And uh, he came home. Uh, got his act together and had a happy marriage working as a high, line, high power man uh, uh, the power high lines mm -hmm. and uh, living in Wichita Falls and married to a very sweet lady and uh, one day just went off his, off his nut and after that he was in and out of VA hospitals until finally he died but uh I was driving him down to Waco to the VA hospital from Fort Worth uh, the last time I saw him. And uh, since we were alone, I said, uh, Merle, uh, what happened in, when we were coming to Texas from New Mexico? And he says, your mother would kill me if I tell you. I said, I want to know. I have a right to know. And he said, well, uh, something stopped the car. And uh, there was this white light, and he said, then they put something in my head in the tent. And that was it? That was it. Okay, so he got something put in his head as well, huh? Yes. I think they, they put those tents up, one for each of us. That's what I think. Yeah, because there were four tents, right? And and uh, you didn't recall seeing anybody else from the automobile in the tent that you were in, right? No. No. Whenever I was uh, when I was when I realized the nurse was coax, trying to coax me out of the car, uh, they were all gone. My mother was gone. Uh, Merle and Carl, her cousin, that was driving the car, they were gone. So I would suppose they were in the tents. Had already been taken. All right. Do you um, do you are you aware of any effects from whatever it is they they placed in your head? No, but I remember a follow up that was done that I haven't told you about. Okay, hold that thought and tell me when we come back from this break. We'll be back, folks, right after this.
With me this evening is James Horak, and we're talking about some really, really different perspectives on uh, some of this uh, extraterrestrial and UFO stuff. James, when we went away for break, you were about to tell us you said there had been a follow-up. Uh, I want you to be able to complete that. Before I was in the first grade, uh, we lived in Dublin, uh, Dublin, Texas, and uh, it was a small town, had a little movie theater, and uh, it was so safe that kids my age were, would go to the movie at night. And mm -hmm. I went to a movie one night at the theater. It was Cleopatra, Cecil B. DeMille's Cleopatra, with Claudette Colbert. Mm -hmm. And... Uh, when I walked up to the theater, there was an army truck outside uh, with these huge tires. It was that uh, army green with the star on the door. Very high up. I couldn't have gotten in it. And uh, so after I pay my dime and get a nickel bag of popcorn that tells my age, I go inside, and when I walk in, there are four men in black suits wearing sunglasses, and uh, they're positioned at different places. And as I go to take the seat, I see two more. Uh, the theater was owned by a man and his wife, Mr. and Mrs. Blevins, and they had uh, one worker who was uh, a World War II veteran and a friend of my stepfather's, who real neat guy. His name was Pruitt, and uh, they, uh, Mrs. Blevins walks up to the to uh, the screen, and there's a, a ledge, kind of like a real shallow stage. She walks up on it. She announces, uh, "We have some people from Hollywood here, and they want to test a new way of enhancing your movie experience at." Uh, uh, important times during the scene they will uh, exude a, a, a scent or perfume and that's they're testing to see if that will enhance uh, the, your enjoyment of the film now of course to me uh, I'm just about six years old that doesn't mean anything other than you know wow and so I'm sitting there, but I'm not easy with these men that are dressed in these dark suits with these glasses because two of them are facing right at me. One of them is over near the aisle where I am, and, and the other one is up at the corner of the screen but is facing me. And the one that's in the aisle is like an usher, uh, two seats down waiting to... to wait on me is the feeling that I got, and I didn't like it. So uh, uh, I started to get up and leave, and when I did, Mrs. Blevins came down, and she said, what's wrong, honey? Are you frightened? Would you like to move further up or back? She talks me into staying. So <clears throat> the movie starts, and uh, now I'm just barely six years old, and I remember the scene where Cleopatra takes the, the asp to her bosom mm -hmm. and uh, this smell just uh, I had a sexual desire I'm not I'm barely six years old and uh, uh, I tried to get out of there but but uh, it was almost impossible and when it was over uh, I, I, I can't describe how I felt, but I know that it was part of some kind of a program uh, and that uh, they weren't going to let me leave that theater until I was through it all, whatever it was. But uh, uh, it did alter some things in me. Did did these guys, uh, these men in black, did they um, uh, talk to you? Did they interview you? Or? Oh, no. No, they didn't speak at all. But uh, 
when later on when I asked Mrs. Blevins about it, maybe two or three weeks later, it's hard to remember, uh, her reply was, what are you talking about? She didn't remember it. Another person, another, another, another kid in there that I knew that I mentioned it to later on in a very strange situation. And uh, he remembered, but it didn't have that effect on him. He and, said he just smelled nice. And Miss Blevins didn't remember. No. Oh no. Or at least she said she didn't remember. She said she didn't remember, mm -hmm. and I believe her. Okay. So you've been you you've been a, you served in the Navy. Uh, you've been associated with, uh, I think it's safe to say, some weird stuff for most of your life. Um, and uh, you're saying that you're part of these objects. Yeah. And what I'm trying to sort of get a feel for is I, I still don't understand how, how it is that you're part of them. Do they... Do you receive thoughts from them? Do they communicate with you? Um, what what does it mean when you say you're part of them? There there were strange things that happened to me over the period of my life, but there was a an incident in Utah that uh, opened all that up to me. Okay, <clears throat> tell us about it. There's a place in Utah which uh, I've suggested people go to. Uh, Dr. Greer, whenever he first uh, became interested in trying to uh, pursue contact, I told him if uh, I didn't speak with him, I spoke to his assistant, who didn't seem interested at all. I told them if they would go there, they could, they would have contact. There is a a place in a national forest in Utah where there is an ongoing uh, operation that is uh, part of what EMVs do. Okay, now, now uh, hang on a second. When you say there's an ongoing operation and it's part of what the EMVs do, is this operation an operation that's being done by our military in cooperation with EMVs, or is it being done entirely by the EMVs? They have, the EMVs have nothing to do with with uh, the military or, or the intelligence community at all. Nothing. Okay, so, so this is something the EMVs are doing on their own? Yes. Okay. And, uh, but, but the area is constantly being monitored by feds who have built an underground complex beneath the LaSalle Mountains. Okay. They have uh, teams that, that scour this area to try and keep people out of it. They can't ban people from being in there because there are a number of miners that have placer claims in there, some of them patented on mm -hmm. wood. And what happens in there? At night, uh, they, these EMVs, mine deep earth and deposits, and they remove them, and then they return them. They remove them and return them. Okay. Why would they return them if they took the trouble to take them away? They return them so that the earth can be reseeded and be uh, once again be fertile after a failed experiment is plowed under. That sounds a little bit ominous. We have to step away for break, and uh, we'll come back and pick up there. 
and then we'll open up the phone lines. Don't go away, folks. More from James Horak right after this. Welcome back to the Kevin Smith Show. My guest this evening, James Horak. And um, we were talking about um, this place in Utah. And, uh, James, you said they mine there. They take material from deep earth. And uh, then they replace it. Uh, are they doing some kind of process with this material before they replace it? It is what they're putting in the rings of Saturn. Okay, well, if they put it in the rings of Saturn, what are they what are they putting back into the earth if it's going into the rings of Saturn? They bring it back and then it and they they replace what they took with what they've they took uh, it's a back and forth operation. So oh, okay, so they they take some and put it in the rings of Saturn and then they gather some up from the rings that has been there for a while. Yes. Okay. And and this is for the purpose of rejuvenating the Earth? Yes. The material uh, is bombarded by cosmic radiation and broken down. And when it's, when it's ready, it's completely assimilable by any kind of tissue and uh, has remarkable qualities. If you put a spoonful in a glass of water, it'll generate electricity. Uh, it's uh, the Indians used to eat it off the ground when they were sick. Uh, it's found throughout Nevada, uh, just heaps of it, sometimes the size of a small mountain, and it uh, it can change. Uh, it can change food production efficiency to an extent that is unimaginable, and it can solve every problem of the planet. Uh, it is what begins life on a planet. First of all, you have to have a, an, an engineered configuration of this planet with its fusion star. The planet has to have a, a moon around it a, a, a certain proportion, a range of proportion to the planet size to make it alive. This drives the mantle like a, a generator. Mm -hmm. the armature, and produces uh, features that will hold atmosphere, provide a gravity, uh, provide what's needed. Uh, this, these are no accidents. This, this is all engineered. This is no uh, hit and miss, uh, a million to one probability. No, this is, this, this is, this is created and managed. In a, in a wondrous and beautiful way. Okay, I'm going to open up the telephone lines for our uh, audience to call in. And uh, between calls, I want to get back to what happened to you in Utah. But uh, let's take this call. Um, before we take the call, let me give you the telephone numbers, folks. The um, main telephone number is 623-444-5889. The toll-free number is 888-223-4599, and that's toll-free in the USA or Canada. If you're outside of the USA and you're outside of Canada, uh, and you don't want to make that international long-distance call, you can use the flash message option on my website, kevinsmithshow.com. Just go there, scroll down, you'll see the link. Caller, you're live on the Kevin Smith Show. Your first name and from where are you calling? Yeah, hi, Kevin. This is Ryan up in Puget Sound. Hi, Ryan. Um, I just wanted to ask, ask a quick question, and then I'll, I'll hang up and listen off air. Um, okay. Um, 
if the average person, I know this this sound like this will be a sixty-four billion dollar question, so I understand if it's too broad of a question, but um, if the average person knew the whole reality behind all this and the big picture, would it seem um, scary and disturbing, or would it seem uh, good news and uh, positive news, in your opinion, or in between? It's uh, that's the question I wanted to ask. I'll just take it off here. All right, thanks. Very interesting question. Mm -hmm. It would be wondrous. All right, now um, let's go back to Utah, and uh, let me let me ask our callers to hang on for just a minute. I want to get this in about what happened to you at this place in Utah. I was told about some patent claims that some people that lived up on uh, Grand Mesa had, the Wassons, that, uh, that was down on the Little Dolores River, just up from its confluence with the Colorado. So uh, I went down there, and I had some other people with me, and we set up a little... Uh, operation just to, to to see what we would get and get some idea if uh, we put anything more in there, if we could make any uh, profit. One night I was coming back from Grand Junction across this park area, which was about a 40-mile drive. It took about two hours because it was a truck, a Jeep road. And uh, it was so late that when I got to a certain point, I was tired, and I pulled up on this ridge uh, to rest before I went down into the, the, the river uh, bottom and uh, onto the camp. When I, I was driving a little uh, Datsun 510 station wagon, and I pulled up the the rear of it to lay down to get a little shut-eye, and I noticed uh, a stream of white discs going back and forth less than 200 yards, uh, well, maybe 300 yards from, from where I was, and they were just silently going back and forth along this creek bed or wash, and then they would go down to the right just almost out of sight, and I could see them turning around a castle rock and coming back. And and uh, uh, I was shocked. So I, what I did, I started walking down to the to the creek bed to get up under them. And uh, as I did, they came about seven, six, seven of them come out of formation and form a V right at me and so I took that as a warning and I went back to my 510 and, and uh, station wagon and got in the back laid down and laid there I was very tired anyway and I just fell off to sleep with these things this still going on I, I, I woke up in the morning and everything had changed all of a sudden, it was like I, I, it was like a, I, my mind was like a computer hard drive that had been blank, suddenly filled with everything in the world. And connections, uh, uh, in the days that followed, I kept having these dreams, and I was seeing things that, that like going places and in, in, in deep space and seeing things that, and, and finally, everything that had happened to me came back so vividly, and I saw things that had been left out, that that I'd been lost some memory of, and and uh, what had happened to me when I was in the navy. Uh, what you know, it it was like the strings were drawing, and I was being given something that made everything make sense. And from that point on, it just, uh, everything changed. And, and I began to to experience 
a relationship that is is part of what these these EMVs are, and uh, uh, I constantly feel a pull to them. I, I mean, uh, there are no words. Uh, this it's it's almost pure emotion, and it's a morning that I'm not there. Uh, I know I've been there. I know I can see what's inside them, uh, and it's 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 the most wonderful thing you can imagine. And I long to be there, but uh, uh, I'm needed more here. Okay, let's go back to the telephone, and we'll discuss that some more here in just a moment. But let's uh, take this call. Caller, you're live on the Kevin Smith Show. Your first name and from where are you calling? Yeah, it's Kevin from North Bay, Ontario. Hi, Kevin. Hello there, Kevin. Hello there, James. Hello. Hello, yes. Um, very, very fascinating show tonight, guys. Absolutely. Um, James, uh, through your, your, your contacts, um, your, do you think that there, there's something to do with 2012 that's happening with, uh, with these objects out there? Is there anything to this that what the Mayans knew about and perhaps perhaps an ascension to, uh, to higher consciousness along with whatever else is going to happen on the planet? Well, Kevin, you, you've asked a uh, germane question that, that I know is on everyone's mind, but uh, I'll say this. The social engineer is responsible for trying to implement the monstrosity they're trying to put on people are following uh, the Armageddon scenario to the T because they think it will lend them power. The faithful will look upon it as uh, the second coming. They'll will resign to it and wait to be delivered. Meanwhile, they're eaten alive. So is there any truth at all to, the, uh, to 2012 and the, uh, the ascension of consciousness? Yes, there in in all legends there there are elements of truth and more than anything else the, we all have genetic knowledge. It's just how well we we can access it. And this touches on some of that genetic knowledge you probably feel and you are uh you're not incorrect, and, and, and you, you have some affinity to it the same way I have some affinity to the EMVs. All right. Kevin, thanks for the call. Interesting question. 623-444-5889 or toll-free 888-223-4599. The 888 number is toll-free, remember that, toll-free in the USA and Canada. However, if you have a calling plan where you can call us without it costing you anything, please use 623-444-5889. I've got a flash message here. I've got uh, several of them. Let's see what we've got uh, from Tony in Australia. I mentioned uh, at uh, uh, one point in the show that we, I could hear this sort of high-pitched electronic sound in the background, and uh, Tony in Australia says, yes, we're getting that high, strange noise also, mate, but it's not too bad. All the best, Kevin. Yeah, I don't know what that is. That's, uh, we, we, we don't normally have that. Say that from Australia. Of course, the NSA's listening post is there. <laughs> well, somebody is, or something is putting that high-pitched uh, noise in the background. I, I don't know what it is. It's not us. Um, look, look, folks, if it was us, <clears throat> I would see it register on the meters on my, uh, on, on my monitors here. Uh, but what I'm listening to here is what you're listening to. So I'm, I'm hearing it as it's coming back to us. So, um, who knows? You notice I have different headphones on tonight. And uh, the reason is the other ones, I can't find them. I moved them today. But they are the ones that I listen to or listen through 
uh, normally, and I hear it before it leaves here. Well, these are not hooked to that. These are hooked to what you're hearing. All right, uh, caller, you're live on the Kevin Smith Show. Your first name, and from where are you calling? Hi, uh, John from Vancouver Island. Hi, John. How are you? Uh, pretty good. Good. Um, <laughs> it's quite the program this evening. Um, one, okay, um, one question I'd like to ask is, um, the, the types of contact that, that James has had is occurring here and now. So, so one question I have is, um, how far back does he think it goes? You mean how far back in, in history? Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Like, we're here now, and there's this kind of contact. Like, has this been going on, like, way back in history? What do you think, John? From the very beginning. Okay, does it, does it happen according to certain patterns? Like, yep. um, I'm, you know, if we were to look back in history, is there, is there a pattern of um, that type of contact? Time-wise, okay. I'm talking about. Well, I, I don't know about the contact, but I do know uh, that these objects have been around ever since any sentient life has. Okay. So they would be involved in genetics. I, I don't think genetics so much as, as they are the um, mechanical designers of, of systems that can support uh, life long enough for civilizations to, to come and go. Okay. So these are kind of like the mechanical engineers. Would that be right, John? I think more, I think of them I mean, James. as, as uh, the, the fertilizer machines of, of a farmer's field. Okay. Um, John, let me ask you a question uh, before before you get off the line here. Are you having any trouble with the video or the audio this evening? Um, I don't look at the uh, uh, video, but uh, I just listen to the audio, and I, I haven't had any trouble. Okay, thanks much. I, I just got I just yeah. got one more. Okay, very okay. quickly. So, all right. So the Saturn thing. Um, Jordan Maxwell talks about Saturn worship, which he he um, shortens to L. Um, L worship, um, like elder, elected, that kind of thing. And I was always curious that why Saturn worship? And it's also the end of Israel, E-L on the end of it. Well, the, the reason for that is the Hebrew word for God is a yell. Right. And, and so it never made sense to me until I'm hearing this this evening with the kind of Saturn connection you know, the mm -hmm. mining operations coming back to Earth um, as, you know, um, seeding everything. To me, I make a strong connection that way. That, that makes total sense why there would be ancient worship for, 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 for Saturn. Saturn. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. So I find that highly interesting. Well, I have to tell you, I've heard just about everything there is to hear, I think. When it comes to uh, UFOs and ufology and extraterrestrials, not that I'm all knowing, but I've run into just about everything that's out there. <laughs> yeah. And I'm hearing things that are brand new for me. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, it's mind blowing. Hey, thanks for the call. Okay. Um, six two three four 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 five eight eight nine, or. Toll free, 888-223-4599. Caller, you're live on the Kevin Smith Show. Your first name and from where are you calling? Hello, Kevin. It's Haya from Victoria, British Columbia. Hello, Haya. Hi. And I have had some blackouts on every time uh, James talks. Uh, he was talking, and then it just went dead, completely dead came up and then he started talking some more completely dead again so well you know again i don't i don't want to ascribe something nefarious to this uh, unless i really know that's happening 
because there is a big storm uh, all across the northeast eastern United States, more snow, uh, and in the southern states, uh, more rain, and it, it could be equipment problems out there on the internet. Uh, it could be, except I'm I'm I'm, I'm uh, northwest, not northeast. Yeah, but my signal has to go from here to you, and no no telling where it's getting routed to. Yeah, it's true too. Um, yeah, I had a um, a question for for J- it's James, isn't it? Yes. Yes. Um, what I wanted to know is, does he have a symbiotic relationship with? Now, is this an energy? He says it's an energy, right? That he. Uh, mm-hmm. That. The, these objects has, are energy. It's just energy. Does it have? Can he describe it? Because I didn't catch that. James? There, yeah, what there do they is, look like? Uh, there, is, there is that kind of relationship, a symbiotic relationship, I'm sure. Uh, but it, it goes much further than that. Uh, I, I know I have a history, and there is a, a pattern to it, and I've been through this many times before. Wow, and you say that you can ask, uh, have you, have you been anywhere around the country at all? Yes. Like, have you, have you traveled in other areas, like UFO areas? Yes. Um, no, have you ever I've, been I've to... I've had UFO experiences everywhere I've been. That's why I have a medical discharge from the Navy. Oh, okay. Yeah, I've kind of had the kind of um, UFO um, instances all over the, every time I've moved somewhere I've had it and I, I, I started when I was about six years old <laughs> so I was just curious to uh, you know if it was a well, symbiotic you see, relationship you see that could be because you see what's in front of you when other people's incredulity doesn't permit them to they have a psychic block you don't have probably I'm pretty highly psychic and I had a um, a major experience this July, so uh, that's why I was asking you. Uh, you know, <clears throat> and did you when when they give you this information? Is it just like a knowing when you receive? It's like it's not like words in your in your head, but it's just like you recognize this is the truth. Well, what I've had is a tug to come. Uh, the it and it and it's it's it requires a great deal of energy to resist it, uh, to try to pull me back. And uh, I'm not ready to go. I'm not through. And uh, I don't, I'm not, I don't give up on man. All right. Uh, hi, we have to run along, but I want to thank you for the call. Interesting questions. Um, you know, um, James, I got a question that I'm going to read uh, one of these um, one of these flash messages. And caller, if you will, just hang on. We'll get to you in just a moment. To the best of my knowledge, James, you've never given a radio interview like this before. Is that right? No. Uh, does that mean no, you haven't, or no, I'm not right? I never wanted to. Okay. So you're on the radio tonight. We're speaking to 143 countries. Why? What made you decide that you would come on the radio and talk to us? We're so close. And this is like a a last stab at a hope for, for mankind. Okay. Caller, hang on. We'll get to you when we come back from break. We have to step away for a break. We'll be back, folks. Welcome back to the Kevin Smith Show and my guest, James Horak. 
James, we have a caller on hold. Let's take this call, and then I want to get back to uh, your answer about why now. Caller, you're live on the Kevin Smith Show. Your first name and from where are you calling? Hey, Kevin. This is Mark from Los Angeles. Hello, Mark. Uh, three things, one for you. First off, we're getting a beautiful signal from you on our feed, and, of course, going through all the compressors and stuff, there's no noise and stuff, so it sounds great tonight. Outstanding. Um, then two questions for James. He was saying that these objects by, I believe, the sun were full of souls. Is he saying that these are what we would call heaven? Hmm, good question. What about that, James? Well, I, I, I suppose that that's an excellent way of describing it because uh, there's no suffering. There, there's a community. Uh, it's very wonderful. You want to be there all the time. You don't want to leave. When you're gone, you, you feel a, um, a mournful loss, and you feel their mournful loss for you. It, it, it's indescribable. So you can actually go there and then leave. So it's not like what we would think heaven is, like once you pass away, that's where you go then. Mark, you'll be there one day. You know, uh, uh, something just came to my mind <clears throat> about uh, this question. Because uh, I think, Mark, you will be familiar with this, and, and maybe James, you are. Uh, in uh, the last book in the New Testament, Revelation, one of the last things that happens, it's not the last, but one of the last things that happens, he says, I saw a city come down out of heaven, and he calls it the New Jerusalem, and he describes it, and he gives its dimensions, and it's 1,400 miles in every direction. And that's about what you've just described uh, as the size of these things, James. I know. Yeah, exactly. Of course, they can be any size. They can be any size. Mm -hmm. there, there's a point at which uh, it's inefficient for them to be any larger. But uh, they can be any size. Wow. Mm. And they can command... They can command uh, a greater, they can be smaller on the outside and yet larger on the inside, and they can do something that uh, they can compress time. In other words, they can cause a time shift? No. Imagine time as a coil, a spring. Okay. They can compress it down so they can enter it at any point without affecting the continuum. Hmm. Hmm, that's interesting. Well, Mark... There's a rare book. There's a very rare book about someone that took a, an interesting leap to understand and grasp this model. And this book is very difficult to find, even though it was published in the last 20 years. It's called Outside the circles of time. And if you can get this book, it's worth quite a bit of money. Outside the circles of time. Okay. Mark, did you have another question or comment? Uh, yes. Um, well, actually two now that you brought up another point. And these objects, who owns them, who put them there, you know, uh, things like that. And then the, the last one, I'll take this offline, is... Um, do these have anything to do with the Stargates, and is he familiar with them? Okay. Excellent. Okay, who do they belong to? Under whose command are they? They are task-driven. They're like an automatic pilot. Yeah, but somebody had to have given them a task. No, it's it's pretty well automatic. It's uh, it, you know if if you if you need some direction, let's just say it's God. But uh, uh, they they hearken back far beyond anyone's memory. Any ET, 
uh, and they are regarded uh, with awe by E.T. Are all E.T.s? Are they regarded with fear? No. No. Okay. Now, do they have any connection at all to these uh, stargates on Earth that we've been hearing about? There are residuals of, of former civilizations who uh, have the, the evidence of which uh, is far beyond prehistory, and you may find all sorts of, of anomaly and a very a great difficulty attaching uh, any kind of interpretation to them in connection with the present and the known past. Uh, these stargates uh, go back to a time uh, before uh, the present mankind was here. Okay, so the, the population that was here before us uh, then you're saying we're highly technological, highly intelligent. Why are they not here now? A lot of a lot of things have come and gone. Uh, there was uh, there there have been more people on this planet at one time than there are now. If they were highly technologically advanced, why are they not here now? Uh, one of them uh, elevated to to a higher form of manifestation, and the others took the wrong path. Now, you said, as we were going to break, in response to my question, you, you've never given a radio interview before. No. This is your first one. And I said, why now? And you said, because... Time is is so close. Uh, I want you to elaborate on that. What do you mean by that? All the wrong paths are being taken. Uh, earthbound humanity is about to devour itself. Uh, about to uh, place technology in a mindless attempt uh, to control people, to control their minds, to control their motives, to control all, everything about them, and to eventually interface them all with a computer. And this is not allowable. And when uh, some of the schemes that have already been voiced and noted uh, of very powerful policy makers begin to take shape and become implemented, this experiment will end. Okay, when the experiment ends, do we survive? Any of us? Well, your spirits do. Your souls do. Um, caller, hang on, and uh, let me read this flash message from uh, Bob in Australia. He says, Hi, Kevin, I think James might have the biggest story the world has ever known. If this is all true, this will rewrite the history of mankind. If it's the real deal, that is. He sounds a little bit like Dan Burish. All the best, uh, Bob from Australia. Um... I, I don't know. You know, there's a qualitative difference, and I'm not saying anything bad here about Dan Burish, but there's a, there's a qualitative difference in the information here because uh, this is, is a whole lot less about technology and more about what makes planetary and solar systems run. So there's kind of a qualitative difference there. Okay, uh, caller, you're live on the Kevin Smith Show. Your first name and from where are you calling? 
Hello, Kevin. This is Stefan from Quebec City. Hi, Stefan. Hi, hello. Uh, James, fascinating speaker and uh, an awesome show. By the way, Kevin, you're coming in 5x5 five five here in Canada. No loud uh, noises. Okay. Um, one, the two questions I have for James is, uh, have these objects around the sun, are they responsible for having sent people here like Jesus in the past? And also, are the suns themselves connected with these objects? And could the suns themselves in various parts of the galaxies actually be larger versions of these ob objects as well? Ooh, that's interesting. Would you repeat that? Uh, I'm having difficulty hearing you distinctly. Yeah, uh, I'll repeat it for you. Uh, are these objects that are around the sun responsible for having sent special people here, for instance, Jesus, in the past? <clears throat> and these objects are in, in orbit around our sun and, and perhaps around other suns. Is it possible that the suns that they orbit are simply a bigger manifestation of themselves. There, there are different things going on in different parts of the galaxy. And uh, there is, that's a very interesting question because there is something very similar to that. Uh, you've heard of uh, uh, binary systems. They're tertiary systems. And in one, there is something very similar to that, to what he describes. I, I find that uh, intriguing that he made that leap. Well, he's a pretty sharp guy. <laughs> Thank you for the show, Kevin, and uh, God bless. I never really bought into the 